GitHub Action is now the most popular build system on GitHub, but it's also much more than a CI engine. In fact, it's a very powerful automation engine. Let's take a deep look at what we can achieve with GitHub Actions. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Coder Dave. As you can see behind me, I finally received my new backdrop. It's not quite as finished yet, but let me know in the comment section below if you like it or if you actually prefer the white background as before that actually was my cabinet. Before we start, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Just click on the subscribe button below right now and turn on the notifications so you will not miss any other video I'm posting. Today I want to talk about GitHub Actions. And the reason for that is many people think it's just for CI CD, where in fact is much more than that. It's a very powerful automation engine that can respond to more than 90 different events to trigger some response. And those includes, of course, some kind of code push, which indeed will start some CI process, but many others, including like opening a new issue or uh, doing a code review and so on and so forth. Basically, if you can automate it, you can do it with actions. I created a bunch of examples and I saved them in my GitHub repo. You can find the link in the description below so you can have a look by yourself and maybe copy and experiment with them. Let's start. First thing I want to point out is the folder structure. In fact, if you see here, we have this GitHub slash workflows folder, which actually is the folder that contains all the GitHub Actions definitions. As soon as you create a YAML file in this folder, automatically that will be a GitHub Action. Of course, you need to use the proper syntax. Let's jump into the first one. This workflow is a CI of .NET Core. First, let's focus on the on close, which are basically the triggers and the events your action will respond to. In my case, I have two events, push and pull request, and I'm filtering by branch, and I'm also filtering by path. And this is because I have multiple applications in the same repository, but I want to execute this CI only for the .NET Core projects, and that means that it has to run only when I make a change it to file in this folder. Another thing I want to point out here is the notation or the syntax. Whenever I have to specify or I can specify multiple values, I can use either of two notations. This one with the parentheses or this one with the dash. And we'll see this more in depth later. Another thing I can use this GitHub action for is actually explaining the variables. You can see here that I have this env directive and in here I can define my variables. But if you see down here, I have another env with another variable definition. In fact, I can declare variables at multiple levels. The first one is outside of the jobs clause, so this variable will be usable in each job and each step of each job down here. This one instead, since it's defined inside a job, will be only available within the job itself. Other jobs will not be able to access this variable. Last but not least, let's talk about variable concatenation or string concatenation. And I have two ways to do that. The first one is up here, which is basically using the variable and then put any other string in between. In this case, folder name slash CS project name. But there is a risk that if your variable contain any special character or anything other than plain strings, then that could cause problems. For this reason, I highly encourage you to use the second notation over here and actually uses expressions and functions to achieve the same thing. I know it's an expression because it starts with dollar and the two parentheses and it ends with the other two parentheses. And in here I have the format function which accepts multiple parameters and the input parameters over here. The output of this expression will be exactly the same as this one but this is more solid because even if your strings or variables contain special characters, this will not break. All right, let's go now to the second example, the Node.js CI. At the top of the definition, I have the same scenario as before, filtering by event, branch, and path. But the interesting part is this one in the middle, because you probably want to test your Node application against different versions of the Node.js framework. And to do so, you could actually create multiple different GitHub actions for different versions of Node, or like in this case, which I think is highly preferable, use the matrix. To define a matrix, you have first to define a strategy, which is under the job. And inside the strategy, you can create a matrix and you can assign as many variables as you want 
on that matrix. In my case, I have three values over here. And what our matrix does is basically repeating the job it's defined into as many times as the value of these variables. In this case, it will be repeated three times. And if we scroll down, we can also see how we can utilize those variables. We can use it with an expression and we just invoke matrix dot the name of the variable. And this will give the step access to the value of the variable for the specific run of this job. Let's see this in action. As you can see here, the build job is repeated three times, each time with a different value of the variable. And if I go into log, I can see that the variable is being replaced with the actual value we defined in the matrix. All right, this was for CI. And maybe you've seen this before, because as I mentioned, GitHub Actions is actually the most popular platform for CI in GitHub. But maybe there were some detail that you didn't see before, and so I hope you find this valuable. Let's move now to DevSecOps. Here I am in the DevSecOps definition. First thing you may notice is that on the on part, there is a different syntax for the event. And this is because, as I mentioned before, you can either use the dash name notation or the square parentheses notation for defining multiple values. And in this case, since I'm not filtering for branch or path, I decided to go for this simpler notation. There are a few things I want to show you with this definition. First of all is that most of the popular third-party tools are actually available in GitHub Actions like Sonar Cloud. And second is that you can define your GitHub Action to do whatever security operation you like to. For example, static code analysis, secret scanning, you can check for password, or you can even do antivirus scan on your source code. But I also want to use this GitHub action to talk about secrets. And in this case, I specifically have two different kinds of secrets over here. The GitHub token is very short lived because it's generated for each run of a workflow in actions and destroyed just afterward. And what it does is allowing the action to have access to all the other GitHub part, like issues, pull requests, repositories, and so on and so forth. The second secret over here instead, it's user defined, which means that I can assign it a value, I can remove it if I want, and it will not change across different run of GitHub Actions. To use a secret in your GitHub Actions, you need to include that in an expression, as you can see here, and then you use the secret keyword dot the name of your secret. So how do you define a secret? To do so, you need to head over your settings, scroll down here, and you have secrets. I have my Sonar token over here, which I updated six days ago. I cannot see its value. And if I'm going to update it, I can set a new value, but in no case, I can actually access its value. And even if you try to log this into the logs of GitHub Actions, the value will be replaced by stars. So again, you will not be able to see its value. Enough talking about CI and code related stuff. Let's move to something more fun. Before we do that, please hit the like button below if you think this video provide value to you or you find it insightful. In this definition, I'm not triggering on any code or file related event. Instead, I'm using a schedule event and this uses a cron syntax. So in this case, it will execute every five minutes. Now I have two jobs, job one and job two. In the previous example, we've seen how to utilize a matrix that is predefined. But here, what I want to do is generate a matrix from a dynamic set of values and then utilize that. I'm using the output variable of job one, which in this case is this variable here called matrix. I call it matrix, but it can be anything else. And the value of this output variable actually comes from the set matrix step in its output variables. And this name is actually this one. So I'm using this variable over here to set the value of this variable over here. And then I will use this one as input of the other job. It's very powerful because it allows you to dynamically generate this value. In my case, it's just this JSON definition over here. But of course, this is to simulate something actually happening. So you can invoke APIs, you can iterate on files, you can do basically whatever you want as long as you have a JSON definition as an output. And what I have to do here is just converting back from JSON and I have my matrix defined. Let's see this in action to understand better how it works. If we see over here, I have job one, which is the one generating the dynamic matrix. And since then generate a two value of matrix, then I have two times job number two with each of the values. Let's dig deeper. If we go into job one, we can see we have a two dimensional matrix over here. 
with file name and file path as the two variables. And for each one, we have some values like file one and file two and some fake path and some other fake path. But the real scenario for this will be having these values generated automatically by APIs or any other way you want and then use that as a matrix. So if we go back to our two jobs, we can see that they've been executed for file one and file two with the folder one and folder two. I know that was probably not the easiest thing to follow, but you can check the link to the GitHub repositories in the video description below. So you can go and check the code by yourself, which is probably easier to understand. Next scenario is even cooler. Have you ever contributed to an open source project? And as soon as you open your first pull request or your first issue, you receive a greeting message or maybe some information that are automatically you know, generated by the platform. Have you ever wondered how that happens? Well, you're about to discover it. In this definition, we actually respond to any pull request or issue event. And we use the first interaction action which is actually an official GitHub action. And the way we know it is because it starts with action. This is a very simple action that allows you to generate some message whenever a user opens his first issue or pull request. And as you can see down here, it accepts either plain text or full markdown. Let's see how it works. This is the first issue I've opened on this repo. And as you can see, automatically, the GitHub action bot created this message for me, which is the same one I put in the definition. And this happened only a few seconds after I've actually sent my issue. If we go to the pull request instead, this is the first pull request I've opened on this repo. And once again, for that reason, I have over here the automatic generation of the message. And you can see that apart from this evident typo in the code, all the rest is properly formatted at Markdown, including the links over here. This workflow, despite being quite simple, is actually pretty important. Imagine if you have a big open source project with thousands of collaborators and contributors and a new contributor come in and open an issue or a pull request. You want to make sure that they follow the rules, the contribution guidelines, they check the documentation and so on and so forth. Now, you don't want to notify them manually. You could, but it's a hell of a work. So with this way, instead, you can automatically notify them under their issue or PR and make sure that everything is in order. Before we close, there's one more example I want to show you. Last example of today is still on issues, but it's a different one. First thing you can notice here is that we are not only filtering by event or macro event, in this case, anything related to issues, but with this type keyword, we can actually filter on different events on issues. Let's dig into the action itself. You can synchronize automatically the status of your issues in GitHub with work items in Azure Boards. It comes from Dan Helm, who actually works in Azure DevOps, and it requires few variables. First of all, it requires you to have the personal access token for Azure DevOps and a path for GitHub as well. And of course, you have to define what organization, project, and area you want your issues to be synchronized with Azure DevOps. And if you want to use user stories or product backlog items or work items, tasks, whatever you want to, how you want them to be created, in this case, new. And when you actually close an issue like here, what you want them to be marked as in Azure DevOps. If you're using GitHub and Azure DevOps together, this action is not only very powerful, but it makes your life much easier. This was a quick showcase about GitHub Actions. But as I said before, you are by no means limited to what I've shown you because there are more than 90 different events you can respond to. And there are a ton of GitHub Actions already created that you can use in your workflows. Once again, check the repo link in the video description so you can see the YAML definition of the GitHub Action I've shown by yourself. All right, I think that's it for today. Hit the like button if you think this video provided value to you or you find it insightful. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, consider subscribing. See you soon at Quarter Dave. Hey.